Well, hey there, Pastor Daniel here as we uh, resume our discipleship hour time, uh, looking now at chapter 3 of the Westminster Confession of Faith, uh, which is on God's eternal decree, or what many call the doctrine of election. Not the election we had last week, um, but God's electing and choosing a people for himself. So um, we're going to go through all of chapter 3 today, and so let's just get right into it. Let me read to you the first two sections of chapter 3 of the Westminster Confession of Faith, of God's eternal decree. God from all eternity did by the most wise and holy counsel of his own will freely and unchangeably ordain whatsoever comes to pass. Yet so is thereby neither is God the author of sin, nor is violence offered to the will of the creatures, nor is the liberty or contingency of second causes taken away, but rather established. And although God knows whatsoever may come to pass upon all supposed conditions, yet he had not decreed anything because he foresaw it as future, or is, that, or is that which would come to pass upon such conditions? All right, we'll look at the rest of the sections in a bit. Here's what I want to just talk to you about. Some Christians come to this debate about free will versus predestination or, you know, human responsibility versus God's sovereignty, and they think they got to choose one or the other. Um, but here's the thing. Just in the first section here of chapter 3, you see that we don't have to make that choice. Um, the writers of this document say that God does all his holy will. Um, he decrees whatever so comes to pass. But he's not the author of sin. So we're not robots. We were not forced or coerced by God to sin. Um, violence is not offered to our wills. So God does not coerce the will. Um, God does use the contingency of secondary causes, um, which is an interesting phrase. So here's the thing. The divines are saying... The Bible teaches both God's universal efficacious sovereignty, but also man's moral responsibility. And I think a really good uh, verse, which um, really shows this to us, is Acts chapter 2, um, verses uh, 23. Uh, so let's look at this together. Acts 2, 23. This Jesus was delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. So, in one verse, we have Peter preaching at Pentecost saying, Jesus going to the cross, his passion, his state of humiliation, his atonement, that was the definite plan of God. That was foreordained by God before the foundations of the world. That was God's sovereign choice. But it was your choice to kill Jesus. So in one verse, you have God's universal sovereignty, but the other half of it, you have man's moral responsibility. And this is a mystery. Uh, how does um, an infinite, eternal being that is God, how does his will interact with the wills of finite, temporal human beings? Like, what's the mechanics of that? I feel like the mechanics of that is way more confusing than the highest form of calculus or physics we could ever learn in this world. Uh, it's as mysterious as the Trinity. Uh, you know, God is one yet three, or it's as mysterious as the person of Christ. He's one person with two natures. How does that work? This is similar, but we should affirm it because this is what the Bible affirms. Let's just affirm what the Bible affirms. The Bible seems to affirm God's universal sovereignty, but also that we have moral responsibility. We make choices, and we're responsible for those choices. Um, Ephesians 1 is a big text on this. Um, Ephesians 1 verse 3 Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and blameless before him in love he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ according to the purpose of his will and then in verse 11 in him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. This choosing, this God uh, planning and ordaining all things, including our salvation, it's according to the counsel of his own will. It's his own purpose. It all goes back to God. So I think when it comes to this predestination and election, uh, God's decrees, this topic, I think the question we need to come to is not should we affirm either that or man's moral responsibility, but I think we should start. We should ask the question: Which one has priority? Does God have the priority, or does man have the priority? Is it God's will or man's will 
that is primary? And I think we should answer, it's God's will. So uh, we'll look at uh, more about free will. There's a whole chapter about free will, chapter 9 of the Confession, and also how God's decrees interact with the affairs of this world. That's God's providence, and that's chapter 5 of the Confession. Let's read through the rest of this um, chapter together. This is about some, um, uh, some pretty you know, difficult things here. Uh, does God predestine some people to go to hell? So, no, section 3. By the decree of God, for the manifestation of his glory, some men and angels are predestined unto everlasting life, others foreordained to everlasting death. These angels and men, thus predestined and foreordained, are particularly unchangeably designed, and their number is so certain and definite that can neither be increased or diminished. Those of mankind that are predestined to life, God, before the foundation of the world was laid, According to his eternal and immutable purpose, and the secret counsel and good pleasure of his will, he chose in Christ unto everlasting glory, out of his mere free grace and love, without any foresight of faith or good works or perseverance in either of them, or any other thing in the creature, as conditions or causes, moving him thereunto, and all to the praise of his glorious grace. And as God has appointed the elect unto glory, he has, by his eternal and most free purpose of his will, foreordained all the means thereunto. So wherefore, they who are elect, being fallen in Adam and redeemed by Christ, they are effectually called to faith in Christ by his Spirit, working in due season. And they're justified, adopted, sanctified, kept by his power through faith unto salvation. And neither are any other redeemed by Christ, and effectually called and justified, adopted, sanctified, and saved, but the elect only. But the rest of mankind God was pleased, according to the unsearchable counsel of his own will, whereby he extendeth or withholdeth mercy as he pleaseth, and for the glory of his sovereign power over his creatures, he passed by them and ordained them to dishonor and wrath for their sin and to the praise of his glorious grace. And this doctrine, actually, I'll get to section 8 in a second. So, um, does God predestine some to salvation, others to damnation? Well, I thought we had a choice in this. Well, we do have a choice. Actually, the, the last section I read there says that God is pleased to pass by sinners. So, he doesn't say, oh... You would have been holy and blameless, but I'm going to predestine you to become a sinner. No, it's in our sin that he passes by us. So actually, we need to look at the question, why does God choose some but not choose others? That's probably the question you're asking. Why did God choose me for salvation but not my neighbor Bob? Uh, isn't the, the other version where we just emphasize free will, doesn't that resolve the problem? Well, not really, because even if you're, you're it's problematic for you and I to say, why did God choose some for salvation but not others? Here's the other problem on the other side. Let's say you go to heaven and God asks you, you know, why are you here but not your neighbor Bob? How come Bob's not here but you're here? The answer would have to be, well, I guess I was smarter than Bob. I, uh, I exercised my free will better than Bob did. I was more spiritual than Bob. I used my brain better than Bob, looking at the evidence for the gospel. It kind of goes back to you, and you get the credit, and um, therefore there's actually boasting in your salvation. But Ephesians 2 said there's no boasting. It's all by sheer grace from God. And so there's some, pro there's some, there's some tension either way. But again, I think if we start with God's will as the primary uh, cause here, that's more biblical than starting with man's will. But I think the big text that helps us answer this is Romans 9. Romans 9 is this text where Paul does go through... The doctrine of election. He talks about uh, Jacob and Esau, and he says, you know, Genesis says that Jacob God loved, but Esau God hated, and he uses that as an example about the elect. And he asks all these like rhetorical questions, like, is there injustice in God's part? And then why does God still find fault? For who can resist His will? And so he gets all these rhetorical questions, and he responds by saying, you know, who are you, old man, to answer back to God? God's the molder. You're the one who's molded. Uh, the potter has the right over the clay. He makes one, from the same lump one vessel for honorable use and one for dishonorable use. Um, we have vessels uh, of wrath that God makes and vessels of glory, right? So he goes through all these um, rhetorical questions and he lands on the sovereignty of God. And... Um, uh, verse 22, I think, really sums it up. What if God, desiring to show his wrath and make known his power, has endured with much patience the vessels of wrath prepared for destruction to make known the riches of his glory for the vessels of mercy, which he has prepared beforehand for glory? 
So, vessels of wrath, vessels of mercy. God's prepared both from beforehand. Um, and he says, God has a reason for this. It's to show his own glory. So, here's, I think, um, the issue. Uh, God passes by some, and God ordains others to salvation. But, I think, if you want to be challenged in this, when you come to this doctrine of predestination... Who do you sound more like? Do you sound more like the Apostle Paul in Scripture in Romans 9? Or do you sound like the objector, the one who's bringing up these rhetorical questions? Um, who do you sound more like? Do you sound more like Scripture or do you sound more like the objector that Paul is interacting with? Um, hopefully we sound more like Paul. We sound more like what the Scriptures sound like. Um, because we should submit to Scripture, even if it's pretty hard on some issues. But here, maybe, here, maybe here's a couple questions you're still asking. Why did God choose me but not my neighbor Bob? Like, maybe I know why I chose the Lord because God is one who called me. God chose me. He chose me so that I would choose him. That's true. But why did God choose me but not my neighbor Bob? Right? So I think the only verse that gives me an answer to this is Deuteronomy 7. Let me start at verse 6. For you are a people holy to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for his treasured possession of all peoples who are on the face of the earth. It was not because you were more in number than the other people that the Lord set his love on you and chose you. For you were actually the fewest of all the peoples. But it is because the Lord loves you and is keeping the oath he swore to your fathers. That the Lord has brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the house of slavery from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. So why does the Lord for love you? The answer is the Lord loves you because he loves you. You know, 1 Corinthians 1 tells us God chose the foolish things of this world. God did not choose the prettiest gal at the ball. He went, he went out with the girl from the other side of the railroad tracks. Uh, God did not love us because we were lovely. He loved us in order to make us lovely. This is, I think, you know, in marriage, I mean, I find my wife lovely, but if my wife asks me, hey, why do you love me? Why did you set your love upon me? If I answer with, you know, shallow things like, well, you're just really pretty, or um, I like the way you cook, or you'd be a good mom. I mean, those are the things that reasons I loved her, but in the end, I just say, honey, I loved you because I loved you. Just know the words to describe it. I love you because I loved you. And that's God's answer. Why does he love his elect? Because he loves them. It wasn't some random and arbitrary choice. He has always loved us for the depths of eternity. And that's the good news of predestination. There is not one moment in the existence of God where his love was not pointed in your direction. God's love has always been pointed in our direction. His heart has been always been directed towards our hearts. That's what predestination means. And so if God's love never began for us, his love for us will never end. And that's I think it's the good news. So we don't have to like wake up in the middle of the night saying, Am I predestined? No, we should wake up saying, oh, Praise God for predestination. I know God loves me because He's always loved me. Uh, this doctrine actually should be reassuring for our faith. Let me read to you and we as we close um, section eight here, which I think is a helpful um, helpful thing to remember as we look at these uh, biblical teachings. The doctrine of this high mystery of predestination is being handled with special prudence and care so that men attending the will of God revealed in his word and yet obedience thereunto may, from the certainty of their effectual vocation, be assured of their eternal election. And so shall this doctrine afford matters of praise, reverence, admiration of God, and of humility, diligence, and abundant consolation to all that sincerely obey the gospel. So this is a high mystery. Uh, we should give praise and reverence to God. We should also have humility about these things. We should not be super confident that we can explore the secret will of God and figure out what he has not revealed to us. We should not do that. We should only believe in the will of God that he has revealed to us. And so I think uh, predestination actually helps us uh, be more assured of Christ's love, more assured in the gospel, um, and it also <clears throat> gives us reasons to worship and praise God. So I love predestination of this biblical teaching. It may be confusing and hard to swallow, but I think we see the goodness of Jesus in it. 
what's our lesson for this week? Uh, we'll come back next week. We'll look at the doctrine of creation and look at you know about those six days and how long those days were or not. So, anyway, take care of yourselves. Grace and peace. God bless.